what's the first adjective you think of when imagining a plant? Green? Leafy? Plants have to photosynthesize after all, don't they? Well, that's not universally true. Sure, most of us are familiar with carnivorous plants, but they're still photosynthesizing and are only getting fertilizer from their insect prey. But what about a plant that does absolutely no photosynthesis of its own? Well, such plants do exist, and in some regions can be quite abundant. Monotropa uniflora, the so-called ghost pipe, is one such plant. Ghastly white and emerging from dense leaf litter and complete shade, this fleshy white flower has likely been mistaken for a mushroom by many a casual observer, but a closer look reveals unmistakable floral morphology. So, if this plant isn't photosynthesizing, what's it doing? Well, to put it bluntly, it's a master thief. Monotropa uniflora is a parasite, but no ordinary parasite. You see, parasitism isn't all that uncommon in the plant kingdom. Many plants will take advantage of other plants around them by stealing a bit of nutrients, but they're still photosynthesizing on their own. A common plant in the northeast that does exactly this is Melampyrum linear. It has no relation to Monotropa uniflora, but nonetheless is still able to both photosynthesize and steal nutrients from plants around it, typically members of the sunflower family or grasses. But Melampyrum appears to be, for lack of a better term, a normal looking plant. It has green leaves, a stem, flowers, the whole works. Monotropa uniflora, on the other hand, is what we refer to as an obligate parasite, a mycoheterotroph, to be specific. It has absolutely no capability to photosynthesize, and as such is completely dependent on its hosts for survival. If that wasn't enough, its victims may come as an even bigger shock. You see, Monotropa uniflora does not steal from its fellow plants. No, no, it's a fungal parasite. Stealing sugars, nutrients, and water from mycorrhizal fungi, which are themselves symbiotic with many species of tree. We'll go a bit more into that in a bit, but first let's discuss the range, anatomy, and taxonomy of this fascinating plant. An extremely widespread species, it is subject to wide disjunctions, often listed as endangered in one region, while rarely being abundant in others. An inhabitant of mesic, deciduous, and mixed conifer woodlands, it is not seen in deserts, grassland, or open prairie, and is often found under the cover of nearly full shade. Here we see that it is abundant in much of the eastern United States and southeastern and central Canada, extending down through the Pacific Northwest. In Mexico, it can be found in high elevation forests, reportedly found as far south as northern South America. It is also native to temperate regions of Asia, such as Japan, Korea, the Himalayan foothills, and regions of China. However, it should be stressed that this plant is by default, typically an elusive and infrequent occurrence in many of the regions where it is native. New England, where it is comparatively common, is one of several exceptions to the rule. Anatomically, there isn't much to discuss here except for the extremely notable lack of chlorophyll, resulting in a fleshy white to pink color. Occasionally, and in certain pockets of its range, they can also appear to be blood red. Below ground, most of the plant is made up of specialized roots known as Hastoria, which tap into the fungal hosts. While typically stark white in full bloom, it begins to blacken after pollination, the nodding flowers turning upward and becoming rigid. The fruit is a dry, dehiscent capsule, splitting along five seams at maturity. If not for these highly persistent dried out stems from the previous year, Monotropa uniflora would be virtually undetectable if not flowering. The above ground portion of Monotropa uniflora is simply a single flowered spike, hence the epithet uniflora. It is worth mentioning at this point that this plant has an extremely prolific blooming period. While the majority will be in full bloom in July in New England, they can appear as early as June and remain in bloom as late as October. If one looks closely, they'll notice a few vestigial, nearly translucent bracts on the stem. Functionally, it's just emerging to reproduce and spread seed, not too different from how many mushrooms conduct their business. 
The flower has a noticeably large stigma, frequently wet with nectar. There are 10 stamens, the thicae of which are easily distinguishable. The anthers are porose, meaning they must be buzzed to dispense pollen, a trait fairly common in its family. But that begs the question, which family could have given rise to such an unusual plant? Surely something obscure, otherwise exotic, right? Well, Monotropa uniflora finds itself, along with its close relatives, right in the middle of the blueberry family tree. A member of the family Ericaceae, Monotropa shares a lineage with many familiar New England plants, such as blueberries, cranberries, huckleberries, and rhododendrons. It is, however, placed within its own specific subfamily, the Monotropoidae subfamily. These monotropes, as they're referred, are further split into three tribes. Monotropa uniflora's closest northeastern relatives can be found in the tribe Monotropii. Formerly sharing a genus with Monotropa, Hypopthes monotropa, also called pine sap, and Hypopthes languinosa, hairy pine sap, share Monotropa uniflora's achlorophyllous appearance, but with multiple flower heads, and in the case of Hypopthes languinosa, a pubescent and dark colored appearance. Other relatives include numerous and frequently co-occurring species in the tribe Pyrolii, such as Pyrola americana and Pyrola elliptica, as well as the beloved striped wintergreen, Chemophila maculata, and its close cousin, Chemophila umbellata. One should take note that the Pyrolii tribe members retain their green vegetative leaves, though it is suspected that they are still partial parasites. The third tribe in the subfamily Monotropoidae, the Pterosporii, contains only two species, one of which can very rarely be encountered in western New England, where it is highly disjunct from its west coast in Great Lakes populations. Pterospora andromeda, so-called woodland pine drops, which are also completely achlorophyllous and share a somewhat similar appearance to Hypopthes languinosa, but they do grow significantly larger. With any parasitic organism, there is typically a complex symbiosis present. The relationship between Monotropa uniflora and its hosts are no exception. You see, not any fungus will appease Monotropa uniflora. It is specifically mycorrhizal fungi in the genus Rusula that it most commonly parasitizes. As mentioned earlier in the video, these mushrooms are symbiotic with various tree species such as oaks, beeches, and pines. The trees supply the fungus with sugars, and in some cases, water, and the fungus provides nutrients such as nitrogen and phosphorus to the tree. Species in all three of those genera are widespread and found in a variety of different forest types in New England, from dry coastal pitch pine and scrub oak savannas in Cape Cod, to rich deciduous beach dominated forests, all the way up to damp montane mixed conifer forests in the New England uplands. If there are tree species that will support Rusula mushrooms, and there is a relatively closed canopy, Monotropa uniflora can theoretically be found. While there is a pervasive myth, especially in regions where it is uncommon that it is only found in old growth virgin forest, the fact that most of this footage was shot in a relatively young, disturbed second or even third growth woodland, mere feet away from a parking lot, suggests that this is little more than an old wives tale. Speaking of which, there is a bit of controversy surrounding human uses for Monotropa uniflora. It has been used by Native Americans in tinctures intended to treat pain. However, the relative rarity of the plant in many localities, lack of real scientific evidence of its pain relieving properties, and the likelihood that the plant may contain toxic glycosides such as granotoxins, suggests it's best to leave it undisturbed when encountered. Even those who assert that there are medical benefits to ingesting this plant typically suggest you seek out alternatives, even other homeopathic medicines, as better options. An unlikely candidate to be planted in a garden due to its highly specialized ecology, it is best appreciated as a natural curiosity and a striking example of the diversity of strategies plants employ to survive in the wild. As always, I hope you enjoyed this video. 
Monotropa uniflora is somewhat of an oddity. We are blessed in many pockets of New England to be able to appreciate it in relative abundance. There are good chances you may see it poking up from under leaf litter should you take a walk through your local woods in the summer. Its eerie white flowers will easily catch your eye, and its near mythological status amongst ecologists and foragers alike will surely captivate you. Thank you, and hope you come back soon. <laughs>